production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week, a new acronym in politics, SINOS. A familiar story in Kansas City, Clay Chastain and Light Rail, and more of the same in Kansas, School Finance, plus Roast and Toast. But we start with our Newsmaker segment and meet the Mayor and CEO of the Unified Government of Kansas City, Kansas and Wyandotte County. Mayor Mark Holland is in the final year of his first term, elected in 2013 after serving two terms on the County Commission. In addition to his work as the county's highest ranking official, Holland serves as senior minister at the Trinity Community Church, a United Methodist congregation in KCK. Holland is only the third mayor in the unified government's history, following Carol Marinovich and Joe Reardon. Wyandotte County and KCK governments were unified by a vote of the people in 1997. The area has undergone major changes since the unification and seen impressive economic growth and development. We'll talk about that and the challenges ahead with Mayor Mark Holland. Sir, thank you for joining us. Good to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I watched your State of the Government speech on the Unified Government's cable channel, mm -hmm. and you talked about several hallmarks of your administration, one of which was economic development. That's now, right. we know about the massive development and the success out west. Let me start by asking you, is there still new development coming? There is. I mean, we have the U.S. soccer complex under development right now um, that's been approved. We have the uh, new car dealerships going out on the Schlitterbahn site. Um, a lot of new development, and we just um, saw in the paper, um, everyone just saw in the paper that we have a new fulfillment center coming out that's going to bring 3,500 jobs uh, to the community. So a lot of great economic development continues to happen, and the manufacturing sector has been especially booming in the United States and booming for us in KCK. And I think we've known for a long time that while development out west was positive, not a lot going on on the eastern part of town, especially downtown. But you have plans, do you not, or goals anyway to try to improve that? Yes, we're working right now on a healthy campus downtown, a $42 million capital investment, which will be the largest capital investment in downtown in a generation. That'll have a new grocery store and a community center run by the Y. Um, it, will, it will be a catalyst for the um, housing and other development around it. What about Cabela's? It's a major attraction for Wyandotte County, indeed the entire state of Kansas. And uh, we're hearing this week that uh, Cabela's is talking about opening a similar site in Lee Summit, although there's an agreement with KCK that they can't do that within 150 miles. And although I'm not very good at geographic matters, I suspect KCK and uh, Lee Summit are not 150 miles apart. I think they're only 30 miles apart. Um, we are aware of that and we're working with Cabela's. Cabela's has been a great partner for KCK um, and continues to be and I trust will be into the future. So we've just got to feed the lawyers and figure out how well, we're gonna is, work it is out. Is there a contractual agreement? There is and Cabela's has honored every piece of it. We've honored our contract as well. And it's not just an agreement between the unified government and Cabela's, there's also the bondholders for the star bonds. Um, who have a legal um, uh, piece of this as well. So we'll get everybody's heads together, and I'm confident we'll work something out that's going to be amicable for everyone. We know the American Royal is moving its World Series of Barbecue to Kansas City, Kansas, yes. and we know the American Royal is not happy with Kansas City, Missouri, and is looking at other sites. In your speech, you said, people ask me about the American Royal, and I say, maybe. Right. Uh, is that a more definite maybe now? Well, what we want from, and I think what the American Royals vision has really grown from what it is right now, I mean, they want to be a hub for the agriculture um, and agribusiness, this um, uh, animal health care corridor that we're trying to create from Columbia to uh, Manhattan of really trying to be a hub for this growing animal science. Um, if they can be that hub, um, that would be something that would be a game changer for them and really for our community. So if it's possible that we can pull all these things together, um, the funding's the big issue, and of course well, our governor's very supportive but, but, of it. But star bonds are going to be available for that, are they not? That is what um, the governor and the legislature are trying to work out right now. If we can use star bonds, star bonds are the most powerful economic development tool in the state of Kansas and really in the region. But, but you're going to try to get the American Royal to move to Wyandotte County, right? If we can, if we can work it out, absolutely. It's got it, it'll it'll need to pencil. Um, all of our deals need to pencil. But if there's a way that we can bring a major hub for agriculture 
out here and the American Royal would be the center of it, we would love that. Okay, a couple of quick final questions. City owns the Indian Springs Shopping Center, what we used do. to be that. That's right. Uh, it's in a state of rubble right now. It's being torn down uh, and you say whatever goes there will be there for the next half century. What do you expect to go there? Well, we'd like some retail. I mean, obviously the closed malls all over the metro area are under duress. Metro North, Metcalf South, Bannister Mall's gone, Mission Mall's gone, and now Indian Springs Mall's gone. Um, we need we control those 100 acres. We'd like to see some retail. We've just built a new bus station and police center there. Um, we'd like to see retail. We'd also like to see some jobs, so there's going to be some opportunity for light industrial there as well. Another shopping center? Um, I'd be surprised if it were a full-scale shopping center. It's not going to be 700,000 square feet like you had at Indian Springs. Uh, we'd like to see some enhanced grocery opportunities there. Um, grocery stores are one of the biggest retail needs we have in our community. Running for re-election? Absolutely. All right, great. Got to run. Thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure to meet you. Appreciate your time. Thank you for the invitation. The Unified Government Mayor, Mark Holland. Now, let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Teresa Garza is with Lincoln Consulting. Steve Rose is a Johnson County civic leader and a columnist with the Kansas City Star. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Welcome to all of you. Thanks very much for coming in. It's good to see you all again. As expected, Kansas Governor Sam Brownback is calling the Kansas legislature back into session at an estimated cost of $40,000 a day to deal with another struggle over school finance, the result of a state Supreme Court ruling. The court says the state is not equitably funding Kansas school districts. And if left unresolved, the court says schools must close by June the 30th. The disagreement, according to the state's attorney general, is over about 1% of the $4 billion the legislature sends to Kansas school districts. Is this a fight over principle, politics, both, neither? Let's start with Mary. Well, it's a... Uh... It's a crisis more than just a fight from my point of view. It's the crisis that we've been all hearing about and Steve and others have been writing about for a very long time and that is the desire of Sam Brown back to control not only the executive branch and the legislative branch but the judicial branch of the, of the state government of Kansas. Uh, one way he's doing that is by continuing to underfund uh, the schools in the state, uh, did away with the state formula and so on that was there for quite a long time, went to block grants. Anyway, the court has ruled that the legislature has not equitably funded the schools of the state. Section 6 of the uh, Constitution says that every child should, generally speaking, have the similar amount of money backing them up, and that's the general principle, and the politics is wild because of uh, Brownback's unpopularity, because the extremist faction of the party that controls both houses, and the politics is, is becoming, well, I don't know, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. I think that what will happen is that they will Oh, they find will. the 38 no or 50 million dollars. Well, we have fine. seen it before. Yeah, there fine. have been episodes in Kansas history where the <clears throat> Supreme Court threatened to close down the schools and nothing happened, and not that's always right. during well, but that, but not that always during Republican administrations. It didn't but come we, at a time, Mike, when there was no money well, in the till, when, yeah. well, when the debt, when the state was in debt. We, we assume that the <laughs> legislature, you assume, Steve, the legislature will comply oh, yes. and come up with millions of dollars, and the court will say this uh, is fine. Oh, yes. Keep schools open, but Woody. Is there a rationale for the legislature and the governor to say, no, we're not going to do it? We're the elected officials. We'll decide how much money is allocated. Well, it's interesting to say that Brownback's trying to control the judiciary when, in fact, the judiciary is trying to do the legislature's job. The fundamental basic basis of our Anglo-American constitutional system is money is appropriated and spent by your elected representatives. All the other rights rest on our capacity to withhold the money. Uh, so the extreme position to me is that over $90 per student, because that's what 40 million comes to in Kansas, $90 a student is inequitable. If your district spends $90 more on the Shannon kid than your district spends on the Garza kid, then that's a gross inequity calling for the judiciary to tell the legislature how much money it has to raise and spend. 90 bucks per student? If somebody has 
gone around the bend on this issue. It is the plaintiffs in these lawsuits and the Supreme Court which should simply have said this isn't a big enough issue for the court to intervene in the uh, legislative And, and courts usually stay out of political battles and some may... In Missouri they do. I'll tell you, they battle. were asked to do this but in Missouri and they refused. always interpret the Constitution. But, but, that's that's their why job. you have the three Teresa, branches and the checks and balances. They do not interpret right. the Constitution uh, in a way that gets them in a war with another branch of government over something well, no bigger than $90 and, and the a student. The merits of the they find a way to this duck about, an issue. This is about equitable well, education. But Teresa, $90? Like, Teresa, the court is not saying Come on. you have to pay $38 million more. No. The court is not saying anything right. except change it. And it makes it very difficult, I would think, for legislators to know what to do. Correct. Oh. But when you have the court saying that, you know, it's not equitable as it is right now. So you right. need to figure out a way to make it equitable so that it's a level playing field and, for and all those And the attorney kids. general, who is a Republican, asked the court to, to take away the idea of closing schools. It was grossly yeah. inappropriate. Right. Do you think the Supreme Court will consider that? I don't know. I mean, and we've seen what the impact of closing schools has been in Kansas City. So it'll be interesting to see. And then you also had the fight, you know, with the Kansas City schools. So there's similarities in that aspect with independence and fighting for those schools because of them closing. So I think that that's um, something that's going to be thrown out on the table well, as well. Th yeah, this is, I mean, on a practical basis, this is an election year. Everybody's up for re-election. And the polls are very clear. The Supreme Court is held in high esteem in the state. The legislature and the governor are held in very low esteem. And 70, more than 70% of the people in Kansas say they want more money spent for education. Right. So Regardless these guys are not going to go out until there until their taxes are increased. <laughs> well, in my well, you, you yeah, well we got we got to wrap it okay. up. Okay, uh, go ahead. Well, go, I'm, go ahead. If you're going to wrap it up, I'm done. <laughs> well, I was going to wrap it up. <laughs> we're it's all a wrap. Up. Right. If, if you're done, if you're done, we're moving on. All right. All right. You knew it was coming. Another <laughs> attempt at light rail by Kansas City chronic activist Clay Chastain. And equally unsurprising, a move by transit supporters to expand the recently launched downtown streetcar system. Never one for modest projects, Chastain is hoping to force a citywide vote on a 25-year sales tax increase to finance light rail from KCI to South Kansas City and from Union Station to the sports complex. Projected cost, about $2 billion. Less ambitious, a plan from the Regional Transit Alliance to expand the downtown streetcar system four miles south to the plaza and UMKC. The Alliance project would cost about $225 million, add eight new streetcars, and create a transportation development district to finance the plan, the same approach used for downtown. So just a few weeks after the launch of the downtown streetcar, Teresa, are you ready to see either or both of these plans uh, be seriously considered? I think that um, eventually, yes, having to have the, the conversation of extending it, I don't know what that looks like plan-wise. Um, I think the Chastain plan right now is not feasible. Um, you still have to get that skeleton, and as we've seen in most cities that are successful with streetcar transit like San Diego or even the Chicago L or New Orleans, it starts within a certain area and usually loops through before they start bringing on longer um, you know, longer lines. Um, and so I think that that is the question of how you continue to loop it through before continuing to develop it um, just straight from the river south. We're still missing um, communities of color. We're still missing areas that need a lot of economic development and that really have a higher need for transit or transit options. Um, and so I think that's still being missed from these particular plans. And well, how do we address well, that particular well, issue? Yeah, but they, in the plan, the last plan, the people of color and the people east of truth said no. Correct. They didn't want it. So they're coming back with a plan now that cuts them out. I mean, that's the only right. way they're going to win, right. obviously. That is <laughs> right. But also, those the, the plan last time, there was obviously some things that people did not like about it across the board. So it's getting that right plan. It's making sure you have that funding mechanism in place. It's making sure that you do the community outreach into those communities, Steve, which was not plan, done last time. There, there was plenty of development existing along the line to tax. And one of the problems is if you take it east, there aren't, there isn't the kind of commercial existing development and residential that could have this kooky funding plan that we have. Now the kooky funding plan worked. 
Right. And it's great. And I love writing on it. And it's just Do great. Think, and it's packed what about all it the down? time. Do we think the Plaza Merchants are going to be uh, Southwest Steve, Boulevard? We think the Plaza Merchants are and up through me, can I, uh, <laughs> moderate the program. Uh, Steve, you think yes. the Plaza yes, yes, Merchants yes. are going to be excited about the idea of uh, additional property and sales tax? Yeah. Well, no. Well, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I thought you were. But they may not. They may not be the decision makers. They may be excited about the streetcar coming up their way. They will. Right. Unless, unless. I mean, there are some issues regarding who comes at night and if they're going to have some of these flash mobs again. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think the streetcar. Well, <laughs> on the street. Yeah, car? no, but I think the streetcar has I been. I think Woody led this. I think it's been proved to be very popular. I think the people on oh, the plaza, is. the retailers, the merchants would welcome it to come. And sure, it's going to cost a little bit but, more. But, but I, I have no doubt they'll vote for it. Do you think it. a month and a half is sufficient time to judge the success of the streetcar system downtown? No. Um, no, of course not. But it's got <laughs> a good. It's got a better start. <laughs> But Mike, they haven't had a start than anybody They haven't had a down a down play. night yet. I mean, and it's the, it's the amazing. Same with Atlanta, and the same with I mean, there's other areas that had great success at the beginning too, and we've seen it already decline. So I don't know. I don't think a month is significant. May I talk to Woody? Well, you can talk okay. to Woody all you want. Woody, she's <laughs> making a good point. <laughs> <laughs> even, even if Clay Chastain gets the requisite number of signatures and they're valid, do you think the city council will, in any likelihood, put his plan on the ballot? Oh, you know, if I were on the city council, I'd vote to put it on the ballot because it's going to lose. And while Mr. Chastain will never learn anything from that, there's a message there. And it, it, it's, again, if I were on the council, I'd vote to put it on the ballot. Now, look, the only thing you can say for Clay is he's... He's persistent. Persistent. Uh, uh, that <laughs> persistence crazy. is not always a virtue. <laughs> but he's raising the ultimate question, okay, we're building this thing yeah. down Main Street. Where is it supposed to lead in the end, which is a question Teresa's pointing to. We're not just trying to build a tourist trolley down to wherever, 75th Street or something, I don't know. What is it ultimately supposed to be? Because how you build it, where you build it, and so on. Ultimately, this is a citywide obligation. If the TDD won't pay for this thing 10, 15 years from now, guess who's going to be picking up the tab? Would it be taxpayers? I the, think you're right. right. Well, different and set of taxpayers. No, uh, yeah, all well, the taxpayers and, and, in the city I, who will never have voted on it. And I don't think the Transit Alliance people have said this would not cost anything for no, passengers. Then. And, then, you know, it is just a long... One this, reason for the success of the We're looking at a long process into uh, 2020s years. Uh, why are we even discussing anything that... that Clay Chastain brings and gets his name in the paper and proposes. I mean, I really, I've, I've been talking about him since I was on talk radio in 10 years here on, on, on Ruckus. It's astounding but, that we take Mary, him seriously. It, no, yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. But when he comes outrageous. to the city hall, and he has the petition. A lot petition. of people come to City Hall. I know, but he's got the signatures, <laughs> well, he's got a petition. He, he, he's, Unless the he's council... He's following the ordinances ordinance. that are in place. Right. And when the he crazy, follows crazy the law... Ordinances. The ordinances. Well, they may but be. They're there, but, but he they're follows there. the law and he mm -hmm. hands them a lawful document right. and they'll review it. And if there are enough valid signatures to put it on the ballot, Unless, the council will find a way not to. And the numbers to. really Unless low Unless the now. numbers are... <laughs> right. so, well, that's... But if the project is literally so unfeasible... Yeah, they can... Then they have the right to say, no, this is... they did that the last time. That's exactly right. That's right like real plan. Yeah. Well, we know the term rhino, Republican in name only, usually aimed at people thought to be insufficiently conservative. And there's dino, Democrat in name only, apparently aimed at those thought to be insufficiently liberal. And now with the arrival of Donald Trump as the GOP's presumptive nominee for president, the dawn of Sino, supporter in name only. This appellation is hurled at Republicans who say, on the one hand, they support Trump but on the other, don't defend his apparent public policy positions. Some Republican leaders fear Trump's views will have a toxic effect on GOP candidates seeking state and national office this fall. One political writer says the best policy for Republican candidates over the next five months is to, and I quote, put a bag over your head. So Steve Rose, can you endorse this piece of advice? I think that if I were a Republican, I would run as fast and as hard as I could away from this man. I think this is going to be serious, one of those Goldwater Johnson landslides. And it is going, it, it, take Kansas as an example. You know, even, even Kansas went Democrat during the Johnson yeah. Goldwater race. Right. That's, how, that's how lopsided they can become. And I think this is going to be one of those. And I think, you know, and I, if I were down ballot, 
Absolutely. I'd be worried about this guy dragging me down. There's no question about it. I think this is a, a, a very dangerous issue. And Teresa, that. do you think candidates running for state office uh, are going to have to answer questions about Donald Trump's views? I would not see why they wouldn't. I mean, it's been historically common for that to happen when you have somebody on the, high, you know, up higher on the ticket that you have to answer um, to their policies because you're the same party. So I think that's only a given. Um, does it necessarily, I think it, it depends on the person that's running and how they maneuver through those questions and answer them. Uh, Woody, uh, it appears there's no longer a serious effort underway to try to find someone to come in and give Republicans who don't feel comfortable voting for Trump and don't want to vote for Hillary Clinton to find someone to vote for. Do you think that that plan has been exhausted and nothing well, sure. has come well, of look, it? It was exhausted before it started. Uh, the only people who didn't know it were delusional, as Bill Crystal appears, for example, to be on this issue. They don't, they will not face the fact that one of the major things that made Trump possible uh, is them and that the lack of trust in their leadership is a big part of the reason he's standing there. And therefore, when they say, oh, we're going to save you from Trump, they say, voters look back and say, no, Trump, we hope, is going to save us from you. Uh, look, this is a case of God save me from my friends uh, on both sides. The people who are supposed to support the Republican, presumptive Republican nominee, are effectively not doing so. They're supposed to be his friends. They're not. Trump is supposed to be the friend of, uh, of, a, of those who are willing to utter facts that you're not supposed to utter anymore, even the obvious and vital ones, and he will say them. The trouble is, like the South on states' rights, he's going to give a bad name to that, and so we'll be another generation before anybody can speak the truth about things in this country. And so he is our friend, but guess what? He's going to do more damage than our enemies. Uh, let's talk about Hillary for a second, Mary. Oh, uh, she is the nominee, or certainly it appears she she's the nominee of the as Democratic of Party. As I Mike last night. And, and there's a, yeah, Washington, after the, DC. Uh, the D.C. primaries. A lot of discussion about who will be her running mate, and some speculate Senator Elizabeth Warren. Do you think that would be a good mix? Well, I didn't, Mike. I mean, I've been watching the top ten lists float across the screen, and uh, agreeing with about half of the people on the list. Um, it's important who ch she chooses because it will be a reverse of the situation when the current president had to pick. He, he had to focus on domestic relations. So Joe Biden's 35 years in w working in the, the world at large and in, in, in international relations was one of the reasons he picked him. Hillary has done that as Secretary of State, so she can choose someone like Elizabeth Warren whose primary expertise is the uh, all the all the issues affecting consumers and and ordinary folks but, in but their Mary, pocketbooks. Let me ask you a question. I just a quick question. Hillary has the female vote. And, oh yes, and <laughs> she does, and she's she getting killed on the male vote, and that is true. And so the, I I asked the question: Does it make sense to go that direction and, and, and to merely well, multiply the? It, it kind of does, well, and I'm not. I didn't think that this was a very good idea until I started watching Elizabeth Warren at the end of this process. She became a national. She was a national leader, but she spoke out at the end of the primary process about Trump really directly. Hillary took picked up from that. And she's been on a roll ever since. And by the we, way, we stop there. Uh, some of the men that don't support we, Hillary we to, are Bernie's guys. We have to stop there. Uh, <laughs> she'll secure Massachusetts for the Democrats. Well, uh, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now it is time for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets cheer or jeer people and events in the news. We begin with Mary. Well, tonight I'd like to uh, uh, toast to Ken Burns, who everybody who watched public, public television uh, knows and loves the great documentarian, his American historian, who delivered the commencement address at, at um, Stanford University, and he used it, surprisingly to some, to uh, deliver a blistering takedown of Donald Trump. And he said some of the following things. He said, described him as one who insults veterans threatens the free press, mocks the handicap, denigrates women and immigrants and all Muslims. And he said that we ought not to be 
uh, taken in by what happened at Orla in, in Orlando, and he said, uh, it's more demagoguery on his part, and he quotes Lincoln and says, we must disenthrall ourselves about guns and okay, violence in Let's our nation. <laughs> so my quicker yeah, um, toast is going to be to, I wrote a column about this last week, but I want to say it again, Ben Craig, icon of Johnson County in Overland Park, is, has a few months to live, he knows it, and he's doing well with that, but he's decided that he wants his ashes flung over Metcalf Avenue, <laughs> because that's the spine of Johnson County, and that's where he helped make this a great community, so. And you think it's going to happen, right? Uh, the, 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 the ashes? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, Woody. Uh, a toast to the British people. Donald Trump isn't the only one who notices things you're not supposed to notice. They've noticed that the euro doesn't work as a restraint on their southern members. And they have noticed that Angela Merkel gets to decide how many Muslims are going to live in England. They're not convinced they like those things. And so they're asking questions. Whether they ought to get out of the European Union, I don't know. But the fact that they have shown the leadership of their country that it's actually a question to be decided by them is a very good thing indeed. A toast to them. Teresa. Okay, yes, I would like to roast Trump for this past week. Um, may, m mostly the fact that he continues to perpetuate fear and hatred towards specific groups of individuals, uh, most recently Muslims, and lumping them all together as militant. Um, I think that that only does, um, it does not make Mer America great again. And finally, a toast to Larry Reed, president of the Foundation for Economic Education. Appearing on television recently, perhaps inspired by the presidential campaign, he outlined his opposition to socialism. Socialism, he says, appeals to the primitive, non-creative, slothful, dependent, demoralizing, unproductive, and destructive side of human nature. Obviously, Mr. Reed did not feel the burn. And that's Ruckus for this time. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night. <laughs>